No, well, <laughs> don't waste it though. Okay, so we're gonna do a, pro um, a proclamation. Um, first of all, I, I put together a proclamation to just recognize Juneteenth as, as a, it's now a federal and a state holiday. And we have an upcoming event. Um, so I'm gonna read the proclamation and then we'll make the motion. Um, and I hope to read this at the oh, event yeah. and have a nice one to give you guys. So I'll have to, oh, okay. Um, so whereas the residents, businesses in town of Simsbury, Connecticut are firmly committed to pro promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion, along with celebrating the cultural traditions of our community, and whereas on June 19, 1865, Union soldiers led by Major General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston, Texas to enforce the Emancipation Proclamation signed by President Lincoln over two and a half years prior on September 22, 1862 and freed all remaining enslaved people in the state of Texas. And whereas Juneteenth, which combines the words June and 19th, is a worldwide celebration which commemorates the end of slavery in the United States of America. And whereas initially a regional celebration popular in Texas, Juneteenth grew to become a national event during which African-American communities gathered to share in the spirit of the day, featuring outdoor activities, food and prayer services. And I see a couple typers I made here. And whereas the town of Simsbury will hold a Juneteenth celebration at the Simsbury Public Library on June 19th, 2022, bringing a greater awareness, awareness of this holiday and its significance in African-American history and in the heritage of our community and our nation. Now, therefore, I, First Selectman Wendy Max Studis, call upon our community to join in this celebration, marking the emancipation of black Americans in the Confederate states that followed the end of the Civil War, as Juneteenth not only commemorates the past, but it also calls us to action today. And then I, I hereby sign my, sign my name in the town of Simsbury Seal on this day, um, the 13th of June, 2022. I do want to thank Tom Fitzgerald for making some historical corrections to my um, content here, and we'll get a nice proclamation put together to bring to the Juneteenth event. So. Our, our DEI council and our DEI liaisons, Eric and Sean. Um, and I'm going to move effective June 13th, 2022 to endorse the proclamation in honor of Juneteenth. I'll second. Did somebody? Oh. So okay. moved. Thank you. Yeah, second. Second. Oh, okay. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. So aye. there there we go. Awesome. Okay. You. So next up you, is you. the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council update. Um, which they will try to keep to 15 minutes. <laughs> and um, whoever's, whoever's coming up, come on up. All right. So um, begging your indulgence, we're going to have Nicole stand up there um, because we don't want to see this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I do have a microphone here. Okay. You're not afraid have, to use it. These are all members of the diversity, equity, and inclusion. Do, can, can they just stand Maybe up? Maybe introduce names? yourselves. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm Rohan Rajapal. Rohan is our new student member. Hey. Um, who you haven't actually appointed yet, but just. Okay. <laughs> We're allowed here. We graduate every year. Yes. <laughs> Mary Margaret Jurgenti. Yes. Mary Margaret. Alex Rieger. Hey, Alex. Alex. Hey, Gavins. Hi. I'm Rebecca Hatch. I'm not a resident of Simsbury, but I'm the rector of St. Albans Episcopal Church. Hey, Rebecca. This is my child. Hi. Okay. Slash driver. Okay. We won't take that away from your time. So, and I'm Cheryl Cook. And I'm Nicole Kodak. Okay. Thanks for having us. And we're going to go quickly. Just to give you an update, I think the last time we were here was, was it April last year? It's been a while. Wow. But you've had some business before you. So we've renamed ourselves um, taking public input and mm -hmm. very, very wisely. It's just now a mouthful. So we're... Mm -hmm going to Simsbury DEI Council and explaining what it is when necessary. Mm -hmm. All right. So our events, you can read it. I'm going to, for the sake of brevity, um, just say that we are this Sunday holding our Juneteenth celebration from 1 to 4 on the front lawn of the library. Um, thank you so much for the funding because we have put together, uh, if you've seen the flyer, and also if you could share the flyer, invite people and publicize it, the talent is really incredible for the budget that we had uh, for an off-cycle request. Um, it 
it's going to be really, really fun. Fitzgerald is donating um, red velvet cupcakes and water bottles. We've got um, four different performers of music, drumming, da uh, no dancing. Um, Ninkosi is going to do spoken word and be our MC, and he's always amazing. Um, we have tables with um, children's activities and education about Juneteenth because a lot of people just don't know about it. So um, it's going to be fun, and then we'll have our contact stay connected uh, sign up sheet if anyone wants to stay connected to our events. Um, looking forward to next year, we're going to probably move our Let's Talk, which were monthly um, during COVID. We have never had an in-person one. This Sunday will be our first in-person one. How weird is that? We've had 17. Um, but we are going to move to quarterly, and we're thinking about the concept similar to like a human library. We're calling it the People Library, mm -hmm. where people with lived experience will be available to be checked out like a, a storybook um, to be to tell a story uh, about their lives, answer questions, and give people a chance to unjudge someone by learning a little bit about them. So we're thinking of that model for next year. Um, we have, thank you to our student um, representative, launched an Instagram, which you approved like two years ago. and. Um, now we're just needing support to link our Instagram and Facebook accounts with a password. I don't know if you have that or Dana, but that we have 684 followers on our Facebook account. And so we would like to just have them be able to connect automatically to, to Instagram, which is where everything is now mm -hmm. going. Um, so that's for events. Um, so as far as outreach goes, um, we have a separate outreach subcommittee, as you know. Um, we have spent our time uh, since we last spoke reaching out to community organizations. We have met with, with many, um, everyone from the Lions Club to boards and commissions um, to the bike ped committee. Um, everybody who wants to talk to us, we will talk to pretty much. Um, and I think it has been a great vehicle for spreading the word about what we do. A lot of people, when our, when our name was Spirit, um, didn't understand what that was. So we got a chance to explain that and what we're doing. And um, many people have reached out to us through that process to become more involved. Uh, the outreach subcommittee is now supporting the housing subcommittee in outreach for our housing project, which you're gonna hear more about in a little bit, um, to help us with additional stakeholder meetings and to promote our public survey. Last thing on this slide, on the bottom you see the image of the banner that's hanging across Hot Meadow, and that was a collaboration of two high school students um, and then an art teacher, which I, I love. I know it's not like it was professionally designed. In my opinion, it's actually better because it breaks through and gets your attention, and they have parental permission for us to credit them with that. Mm -hmm. So um, the library is printing 100 bookmarks with the banner and the mm -hmm. artist statement and their names on the back to give out at Juneteenth. Mm -hmm. And we're going to give the banner to the high school um, when we're done. And then we'll see what happens next year with funding if we can repeat. It was the one big surprise on our budget, I will say. <laughs> um, I, I neglected to mention the Historical Awareness of Race series, which we did um, over five weeks in February. Um, the chair of our outreach committee, uh, Lloyd Huey, um, did that along with Carol Clark Flanagan. It's a wonderful series examining a lot of the historical um, aspects of race relations, and you can find all of them on SETV. Um, it's really a very educational program, and it's taught sort of like a lecture series. It goes from one to the other with some continuity between them, um, and we allowed for public comment on YouTube while it was going on, so we had some interaction with the public during it, too. So it was a wonderful series, and I highly recommend it. Joe, sure, qu quick. <clears throat> sure, Chris. Um, with like the metrics on video, um, I I missed every single uh, presentation live, though, though some were uh, mm -hmm. streamed. Right. Um, but I have gone back, like everything else. I mean, and you know all too well how many committees you sat on and commissions you often caught them on video after. Yes. So, did you, did you, have you seen metrics about as far as um, I would say incorrectly downloaded or watched or viewed of of the different you know the different episodes or modules or whichever is there a way to track that and i'd be um, interested to know which ones caught people's attentions and spiked in in, in sort of in topic wise you know, during our the virtual ones we could only yes. tell by who was registered logged on the right library. right yeah. the library hosted our registration for all of them so we could see how many people had registered and how many people logged on but other than that we didn't track it 
right. so to speak. But, but I'm wondering if we could go. It's a great question to SCTV. And yeah, they will have it. They, well, they, have, they don't publish they have, it, but like YouTube, you obviously see how many right. views you have. I'm just curious as to which ones. Going through um, SCTV. As I said, we were in the library so, zone. So yeah. Okay, just curious as to, is it being an interesting so metric? They're doing there? a presentation. Point of information. Uh, I was upstairs televising the police commission meeting, and I currently miss public audience, but I'm able to just do public audience. You can audience. email it to us. I'd like to do a presentation. I'm, I don't think I we... Do that, please? No, we've... I would appreciate it. Um, we've already started our presentation. I know, but I would appreciate to get special exception. Um, I'm not going to make one, Joan, Can because I have it at the end of the meeting? we don't normally have it at the end of the meeting. Some groups do, but we don't. So if you want to email your report to us, oh, that's. I don't email it well, I'm I, I'm post, sorry, but I'm going to continue. Post it on Twitter and okay, Facebook I'm going to con continue and, with our uh, presentation. And, uh, and thank you. And thank yes. You. Go ahead, Nicole. Okay. okay, sorry. Thank you. So next slide, we can sorry, go all right, so our housing subcommittee update. You know, we got the grant from the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving for a one year process in um, inclusive housing okay. and public engagement. Are you supposed to talk about public audience? Excuse me, we're in the middle of a presentation. Me, Dr. Renault, he was not here when we did public audience. I'm sorry, we were already into the agenda. I don't need to explain Thank you, that. Dr. Renault. Thank you for coming. So you can go in it. Sorry, Nicole, and sorry, DEI Council. Um, so this is an overview, Cheryl, do you want me to talk through it or do you want to talk through our overview of what our activities will be for the year with the public housing engagement thing? Um, you can just see we're, we've developed our work plan. We're now holding stakeholder meetings. Um, we also have a survey going and um, then we're, we have held one of our educational events for the public on the housing basics um, in Simsbury, which was not problem solving, just reviewing what are our codes? Um, what is our POCD? And George McGregor was three weeks into the job and yeah. came and presented. So kudos, kudos yeah, to him. And, um, we were thrilled to see mm -hmm. every town planner, including him, uh, presents the missing middle housing mm -hmm. um, as sort of the way forward yeah. to look at. And so we wanted to go right to the source and we'd already contacted Opticos mm -hmm. um, and asked them if they would maybe come and be our um, a community forum facilitator because they know so much about missing middle housing and how, how towns move forward. And um, they're... They declined. They declined. Their, their plate, their bandwidth, they don't have their band, the bandwidth for it. So we're now in the market for another expert uh, facilitator for the community forum. This will probably be late October. And this is where we bring all of our um, learning um, both from the surveys and the uh, qualitative stakeholder meetings to play and have people come together in large groups, probably at the middle school, um, like we did with the first forum that launched Spirit. Mm -hmm. And the, the outcome we're looking for with town officials and um, a very deep representation of uh, residents, especially people that don't normally engage, that we don't normally hear their voices. We're trying to start to make progress on a shared vision for what is housing in Simsbury going to look like? What do we want as a town? So um, our, our hope is that by the end of the year, we'll have a report to the Harvard Foundation and to you with our findings. But um, we're looking to really engage and involve you from the community forum forward. Can I ask a question? Chris has to, um, I didn't want to interrupt, but are you working with the Planning Commission at all? Because they have that affordable housing plan. Um, remember, we talked about last year we were going to try to have a task force and the, the work got transitioned to you guys. Is there a joint effort there because they have a plan that had to be submitted recently to the state? And um, OK, um, well, we started um, this work when we were awarded the grant from the Hartford Foundation. OK, so all of the any funds we're using for this process is coming from that. OK, uh, we have a fiscal agent in the First Church of Christ. They also have a small housing group that, that works on this. And yep. one of their we have one of their members on our housing work group. Um, we would love to to coordinate with the Planning Commission. Um, they are certainly that and zoning are, you know, probably one of the more um, important stakeholders. Uh, Jackie Battis is on the Housing Committee and mm -hmm. she's on zoning, so she keeps us sort of mm -hmm. liaison with them. Mm -hmm. I don't believe we have anybody from Planning who's talked to us for. Not yet. Not yet, but we haven't finished our stakeholder meetings. Right. So we are, you know, we're only halfway in this process now. Yep. Um, 
as Nicole mentioned, we had our first educational event, very well attended. Yep. Um, we, we have ongoing discussions with different um, experts who come to talk to us. Um, we had two developers at our last meeting coming to talk about a possible project. So, yep. okay. so we are gathering all the information we can in order to funnel it back to you. So, <laughs> and the impacts um, to the forum are the affordable housing plan, the POCD, the charrette yeah, output, yeah, yeah. Like everything we already have. Right. And then, what is your lived experience? Do you want to tell about the moving um, voice of lived experience that came and presented to the housing mm -hmm. commission? Well, we have had um, residents come in and, and talk to us. Um, we've had um, people who have come in and said, you know, poverty looks different here in Simsbury. Mm -hmm. And um, this was a, a white woman, you know, married homeowner who is now struggling and, mm -hmm. and told us her story. And her story sounds a lot different than perhaps a younger person who, who we had talked to who is, you know, looking for an affordable rental, looking for, you know, they're in very different periods of their lives. Um, you know, the first woman is having her second child, you know, her husband is working overtime to try to get enough money to pay the mortgage, you know. Um, and that looks a lot different than other people who are looking for affordable housing. So we are gathering all of this anecdotal testimony along with our survey results. And we have a survey team here who's, I mean, a data team here is going to go into a little more depth with you about what that is going to look like. Okay. When it comes back. Thank you. Do you want us to not ask questions so you guys oh, can? No, I love okay. it. Okay. I just want to make sure. Completely. Very interactive. Okay, good. <laughs> and it tells right, us your, presentation your to ask engagement. Questions. <laughs> All right, so let's pass on to the next one. Um, so on the um, so subgroup of everything except for data, which you're about to hear from, um, what we would love, uh, what we want to share with you is our next steps and then what we could use for support from you. Um, we would love to link those two social media accounts. Um, Juneteenth, we have our first um, proclamation, not declaration, which is going to be amazing. And so you guys are going to attend it. Next year, looking forward, we're working with um, the Meadows, uh, but we're going to, again, need off-cycle funds to do a Juneteenth. Um, and we'll obviously put in a request for 23-24 for Juneteenth 24. Um, this year, we are finding um, just that we are um, Pay, we're, we're paying about half market rate for each of the talent that we're getting. Um, so. And do we want to say why? <laughs> well, and part of it is because a lot of the performers who you saw on the flyer mm -hmm. um, really personally felt that it was important to bring this to Simsbury. Um, we have a reputation and mm -hmm. it was important to the people and so they are taking as Nicole said, about half of their normal fee to come and do this because we feel like it's a, a message and a celebration that, that needs to be had and um, to broaden the acceptance and that's why we're doing it. So we are benefiting from that this year. Next year, we'll not. Uh, or as Nicole mentioned, we're going to partner with the Performing Arts Center next year, so that's going to be a whole different we're going to sort of be the junior partner next year. So they're, which is awesome, and yeah. they're they're looking to have national scope bands every thirty minutes. Like it's it's going to be a really cool thing. My hope is that I'm talking to Missy about this, that we can have some of our talent from this year be the warm up act on the big stage for the national people mm -hmm. because they've invested in us a little bit right. this year, and I'd love to see them come and see how far we're growing. Um, are, are, we are offering an event that is worthy of the holiday, and um, other towns nearby, Granby, Bloomfield, West Hartford, they offer bigger, and $15,000 West Hartford's raising right now for their event, and they have committees of 30 people working on it. Um, they've also been doing it a few years longer than we have, um, and, and I just think, I love that every town can use the uniqueness about it. We have the Meadows, so next year, I think it's going to be very a very powerful event. I'm looking forward to it. Um, and so, just give a little shout out to Tom and his staff and his <laughs> Tom, staff Tom, who have you, you know pitched in last minute, you know, moving things around, which is really good. Very much we wouldn't have that. a stage and tents yes. for the performers <laughs> without them because we're on the front lawn. So I'm thinking, let's just do what we can. It's picnic style. And now, nope, we have now Angela we have Griffin and mm. Tom. So I hope you can come. 
I think it's going to be great, and I think it's going to be a worthy event. Um, and then, um, mm -hmm. did you you had a question about the budget request, like the category? Oh, I did. Um, that's sort of a technical um, request, which Maria can probably discuss okay. with us at a later date. Okay, but, cool. You know, just as to which where you want us to be, mm -hmm. because I don't think Kristen wants us in there. <laughs> so. You mean to move out of social services? You're saying? Well, from a budgetary budget line, wise, from a line item. I think yeah, we're going to have to have a conversation about where we belong. That. Yeah, we, we do have a separate program budget for um, boards and committees. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So that would probably, right. I would think, for so something I, like event based or, I just or something of that to, nature. To say we're going to need some yeah. separation, I think, to, yeah. to make this work. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, do you want to bring yeah. Outreach? Do you want to talk about Outreach? We are, um, as I said, we're going to continue in the fall with PTOs. Um, we have many of our members are reaching out to their faith communities that are both in and outside of Simsbury so that we get some different perspectives um, in our survey group. Um, and we, we've already talked about what's going on in housing. So I think we are going to turn it over yes. to our data subcommittee. And Rebecca Hatch is our chair there and she has some data committee members who are going to help her present. Well, thank you for having us um, tonight. I'm going to just give a brief overview of where we've been. So first of all, this is our, um, we really did start with our last talk series about gathering information. They were fantastic, informative series, but we were able to ask, what did people want to learn about? What were they interested in hearing about? What questions did they have? And that really kind of set the stage for gathering some of that qualitative data about DEI in Simsbury. Um, and then through that series, and through our work with the committee, we really knew that we had to have some real targeted goals um, that we wanted to accomplish. And we really used the proclamation um, to be able to pinpoint what it is this committee wants to work on education, housing, health, food security, and criminal justice. So that really has been our compass for the work um, that we've done thus far. And then the next slide, we have um, a little bit of where we were with the funding. So you can see that we did ask for an off -site, a mid-cycle request for funding. We were able to meet with um, Data Haven and Health Equity Solutions to really, again, give us a sense of how do we take this big task, break it down, and, and get momentum in achieving some of those goals. So they worked with us, and um, we were able to submit the report in November. Um, and. Rebecca is going to go over more details of what the report had said. Um, so in the next slide, we're just going to present three slides to just show like a, like um, highlights of the final report that we got from Data Haven and Health Equity Solution. Um, one of the things that Data Haven produces for every town in the state of Connecticut is a town equity report. And that existing data um, became a space where they were able to give us specific guidance. Um, part of our issue in the town of Simsbury is um, these larger data projects that say a data haven would take on give us a certain amount of information, but because there are, there's so few representation of non-white folks in these surveys, we have a hard time really seeing what's going on um, with folks, as, as Nicole mentioned, who might not otherwise be represented. So part of our work, for instance, in the next phase is to really drill down into underrepresented populations, especially in Simsbury. And given that those numbers are already small to begin with, we have to do a little bit of extra work in order to really figure out what's going on in those smaller populations. So you can see the comparison across the top in this table, um, Connecticut versus um, the, <laughs> the uh, Puma that we're in, which I don't know about you, but I had to write that on a post-it. Um, and then Simsbury specifically, just to, just to see. So you can see in that first column, and I'm not going to go all the way across, but you can see, you know, Simsbury is 83% white 
versus the state, which is 67% white. Um, so this is an example of some of the existing data that Data Haven exposed us to um, that gives us some information and we're ready to take some next steps to find out a little bit more. Next slide. We're, we're back. Oh, from, yes. I mean, I, this may be super, what does Puma mean? Yeah, good question. <laughs> I came from no idea what that is. It's a, it's a census designation. Um, and so the Puma that Simsbury is in includes um, Avon, Canton, Farmington, Simsbury, Bloomfield. Bloomfield and West Hartford it has to be at least a hundred thousand people it stands for public use microdata area okay thank you so next slide please they gave us recommendations a whole host of recommendations and again Melissa has this entire report and I can certainly send it to you if you'd like to see it um, and they really uh, spell these recommendations out across those six priority areas that the proclamation designated um, and so this is just an example. Again, you can see, go back and read these in the slides. I'm not going to read these to you tonight for the sake of time, but um, recommendations on how we can move forward, both things that we can do as a volunteer committee. Um, so for instance, reaching out to schools to get data on demographics of free and reduced school lunch plans, that's something we can do. So this, um, this next phase of data gathering is both partnering with experts and doing some work with information that we already have. Next slide, please. Thank you. And then they just gave us suggested resources. I mean, I think one of the things that, um, for those of us that aren't experts in this area, has been really um, uh, not surprising necessarily, but it's been super helpful for us to um, be exposed and connected to resources that already exist. So the 2021 equity pro profile already exists, um, racial equity toolkit, et cetera. So that was part of their report back to us was which of these resources that already exist um, could we um, make best use of? And there's a fourth one on this slide that's not just, just not showing up. So you can take a peek at it in your, in your packet when you have a minute. Um, so that's sort of where we've been. That's the results of the first round of data collect or first round of funding that we did. Um, and I don't know how much of that funding we used, quite frankly, because I didn't get the invoice. Um, so we um, received three thousand dollars, and um, I'm not sure what we paid out to Data Haven. But Alex is going to walk us into what we're doing next. So um, I think that's a really good picture, and it paints a really good picture of how complex the whole issue is, right? Diversity, equity, inclusion relates to, and this is some of the data we're trying to figure out, all sorts of things, right? It's socioeconomic status, it's race, but it's also, and one of the things we're trying to collect data on as well through kind of our housing surveys, how you participate in town events, how you feel in the town. Um, and this is, I don't want to say impossible data, I just want to really say it's very un nuanced picture, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so we are, we're, we're doing what I think is a, is a pretty good job with the resources we have. And part of that means staying connected to local people, local communities, local events. It means working with groups that have um, done similar work in other towns. So one of the starting places was Glastonbury, which produced a really large DEI based report. And we got to tear that apart and say, what did we really like from this and what we didn't? We're also looking pretty far and wide, um, all the way to Decatur, uh, Georgia, which I'm not sure I pronounced right. And I'm not sure I've... The kid I have ever pronounced right. I've made that same mistake now publicly on the record, but like four, four or five times in our in our own meetings, uh, informal conversations. We also have, uh, and I think this is kind of cool. We're creating our own surveys, so basic survey around, for example, September feast. Uh, we received and analyzed 218 responses, and we're up to about 250, 260 responses on a housing survey as well, which I'm in the, in the process of, of analyzing. And that stuff is just producing really interesting data, uh, data around race, data around economic status, and data around how that stuff plays into how you feel about being a member of the Simsbury community. Um, so I think that that's kind of a really cool, cool work we're doing. Oh, you gotta go up and down. I got to go up and down. You're probably looking at the I, I just, I think I did. I managed to figure it out. So um, I'm the only Gen X that messed up an iPad. <laughs> also on public record, right? Okay. Where were... 
All right, so what I'm looking at is not there. Next slide. This is not two connected things. Got it. Where we're going. Okay, so we've already received the $22,000 for um, funding for a large-scale data collection project, and we've spent the last three months or so writing an RFQ, figuring out exactly what we want, really detailed things. For example, we want, uh, because we are the DI Council, we want the vendor that we're hiring to represent our values, right? So one of the things we talked about is we'd like to see if we can find a vendor within our price range that has a diverse uh, board, for example, or employs a diverse uh, range of researchers, for example, right? And so really taking that stuff from the top down has has produced a lot of work, a lot of questions, and, and we've, we've, we've created what I think is a pretty good RFQ for that. Uh, we submitted a draft to you, I think, uh, mm -hmm. last month, right, in May. Um, yes, and uh, we'll be trying to move forward with that as soon as possible. Uh, next slide. Can I just and, ask, quick, mm -hmm. the, this is the funding from last year for, yes. the, yes. for the program, so we haven't used it yet is what I'm hearing, right? Yes. But we've done some study with some of the money? Some like, of the money has been spent. Okay, so. so it was 25 yeah. We had, so, yeah. We broke it out specifically for the for the data gathering. Yeah. Sure. Right. has been spent. Yeah. So, okay, There's at so. At least a tranche left, but I'm not So, what's the RFQ sure what's for to so find now someone? In Maria's hand, she's reviewing um, with town staff to make sure that the questions that are being asked are not just what, what we think, but what okay. is relevant for, for the town work, too. But the funding is enough, is what you're, the funding is what the funding is. Well, right. Right. Yeah. We'll find yeah. out, yeah. right? We're going to find yeah. out, you know, yeah. what, what yeah. the bid is. And, uh, yeah. Okay. You know, this is what we're all going to yeah. find out. Thank you. So right in front of you, I don't want to go through this entire thing, but what you have is basically a two to three year timeline of where we hope to be. And where we are is somewhere between two and three right now. We established our research priorities. We got back our major uh, report. And what that helped us do is say, where do we want to go? Right, and one of the things, for example, we have in our RFQ is that we want to be able to establish a baseline we can revisit every five years, every 10 years, and say, what does progress look like? Right. For DEI, what does that look like? Because it's got to look like more than, for example, just the middle income housing, right, which we've talked about. And that's certainly a component. Right. But it's got to look like more than that. It's got to look like more than just what do our demographics look like or what does our income look like? And we have to we have to really figure that out. And so um, we work for that. We want to assess a baseline. That's kind of what we're going to be doing now. And then we're going to establish targets going forward. Those targets will help inform the last two steps, which will go, and I know it says 22 to 23, but will hopefully go and beyond, right? The goal is to set up a pattern of repeat assessment so that Simsbury can be kind of in this area the best it can be, right? We want to plan five years, 10 years, and keep revisiting that topic. And the goal is is to allow you, as you know, the recipients of this data, to inform policy decisions based on what comes back. I mean, what we're going to see is how residents feel about right. all, I, these, all these different things we're going to ask them. Yes. Can I ask you though, how you know, if, because if we're actually using this data, um, how do we know that the data really represents the residential population? Like, how are you getting it out to? A broader group of people well, that's why we're to make sure to yeah. do that. So yeah. at a best, it's their job represents. to make sure that we're properly sampled. Um, right. So I and can then can mean can people f one person fill it out multiple times? Mm -hmm. How does all that play into data? That's not. That's exactly what we're depending on experts to do. Is to gotcha. Okay. How to make that's sure why we're hiring we're, company. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Uh, that, yeah. We're, yeah. All those good things. Exactly. And I want you to know we're we're really thinking about this. For example, we yeah. did our housing survey and our initial draft had about 150 uh, responses, right? And we had responses that were representative of our town population when you matched up not just about census data, but about, for example, ACS, American Community Survey data, right? And we're doing our best. But then you find out that even though we might be representative, if you have 150 responses, you're talking about like three-ish African American people, right? Mm -hmm. For example, that's one of the things we talked about. Is that even if it's representative at 100 people, if Simsbury is 2% black, for example, is that fair to really draw some sort of policy conclusions from? Right. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, let's wait. Let's see how we can collect right. data for more income levels, more demographics, more, more um, socioeconomic levels, all these different sorts of things from we talk about how house, uh, own, house owners versus renters versus, right? And we're trying to make sure that we really can collect this and collect it well. But the issues we raise, these kind of methodological issues, that's where we need a professional. Mm -hmm. There is one more slide. Um, but it's not. No, it's right. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so this is just sort of what's coming next. So quickly, we're working on this larger scale data collection pro project, um, hoping to move this RS RFQ process forward. Um, we'll be, as Alex said, establishing these baselines. And part of that is working with the experts and whoever we consult with to help us do that. And part of this next phase is working with town leaders and stakeholders to get input, like what baselines are going to be helpful for you. We are not here to implement or dictate policy. We're here to provide information and certainly offer recommendations. But it's going to be up to, say, the, the town, the police commission, all these different um, spaces for people to come up, make decisions about what kind of policy change they really want to see. Um, and then, of course, we'll continue to need funding going forward. If we really intend to go back and assess how well are we doing with these, are we moving the baseline at all? In order to be able to do that, we'll have to bring in you know, folks to really help us be able to do that work well. Our intention from the beginning is to maybe um, take more time to do things and to do them as best as we can, given that we're all volunteers and except for Alex, um, don't have expertise. No, there's a handful of us that have expertise in this. And we're trying to do the best we can. And part of that is taking the time and making sure that we have the experts come alongside us that can do this work well so that we're not going back and saying, oh, wait, we looked over this and a year later realized we didn't get enough information from this pocket of um, the population of the town. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. I have a question about the, the information gathering. So is is it mostly surveying just people that are residents of the town? Like, or, you know, because if part of the problem is Perception. reducing barriers to yeah. coming in yep. and then you're only getting information from the people that are already yep. here, how do you try to capture information or experiences from people that feel like they're struggling to break into the community right exactly. and we are those are two different aspects of, right. of our data collection this data project the, the main one that that we were paying for um, is simsbury residents um, what we're doing with the housing um, series is going to include people who do not live in simsbury um, and our next educational program, or perhaps the third one, um, will include um, people from who don't live in Simsbury, um, say real estate brokers. You know, right. how do people who they are showing around town react? You right. know, to to different aspects of Simsbury. So we are going to see some of that through okay. the housing project. And um, just so you know, I mean, we are keenly aware of perception issues. We talk about it a lot in yeah, our work and are keenly aware that, to your point, we're only getting information from people who chose to live here. Why did somebody choose not to live here? Yeah. That actually may give us more information that we need, right? right. Um, so great okay. question. Thank so that's you. why we're reaching out to, um, like some of our members go to churches who are not in town. Right. They're going to go right. through those communities. Um, but there generally has to be a nexus so far right, for right. us. We, the exactly. survey, for example, for housing has expanded to um, any nexus. So if you work mm -hmm. or if you pray or if you have a community right. here, you're you're welcome to take it. But I'll, you know, to be frank, the response rate from non Simsbury residents is yeah. reasonably low. Mm -hmm. So you ask an mm -hmm. excellent question, and I think you're you're completely yeah. right. How do we how do we prove that negative? How do and we find it on somebody who chose not to live here? Right. Right. But yeah. we are doing our best to reach out to people uh, within this, people who, have, who, are, who are touched by this community, so to speak, right. and who may have at one point or in the future contemplate moving here right. to become resident. An obvious connection is employees, people who work here. So um, we are, you know, we've already talked to um, Culture Parks and Rec um, as a stakeholder about town departments that hire people who do not live in Simsbury, and, and that includes almost all of them. So um, that, mm -hmm. assuming they respond, you know, that would be a good data point right, to say, you know, you work here, why wouldn't you live here? Mm -hmm. We also engage with some of the conversations because many people who are in um, subgroups that aren't largely represented throughout the, the town know the stereotypes and have friends with mm -hmm. conversations with their friends about why would you live there given x y and z mm -hmm. so i think at least we do have a baseline to be able to get what some of those outside perceptions would be and then i think we're once we get the baseline from what our residents feel about us then that gives us great future work to work with experts on gathering information about what outsiders feel like and how would we be able to change some of those perceptions as we do this work and make our town feel more inclusive. Mm -hmm.
Okay. Yeah, the one question I have that I find hard to is like, what's measurable about what you guys are doing? Like, mm. you're, you're gathering all this data. Um, you did the you're doing a Hazi survey. We're going to have um, you know this big data gathering thing. What, what are we? Are we just going to like filter through all this data and try to find stuff, or is there you know are you talking to other towns to see what the goal is in to what we're looking for in this data? That's what is very hard for me to conceptualize. Where are we going with all of this? Oh, oh I'm sorry. Well, no, that's okay. Um, the goal, um, going back to what Rebecca said about the proclamation declaring racism a public health crisis, gives those five areas, which is, okay. you know, that's sort of our North Star, how we relate the data to those areas, which we have been, in, you know, asked to, to look at. And that's going to look different for each one of those areas. So in housing, for instance, a lot of the data, you know, as Alex was pointing out, tends to bend on socioeconomic factors. Um, so there are income cutoffs, which we asked people to identify in as to whether they feel like, you know, this type of housing is affordable or not. So you're going to see that when, so when a developer comes in and says, I wanna build a development that is going to have, you know, X number of units at 80% of the median income, you're gonna see, you know, in a survey, how many of those people think that's affordable for, uh, you know, that's, you can put it back to that. Or um, do you want to give another example? Well, I mean, I think, I think that's, that also goes back to bringing in stakeholders and the various departments and commissions in town to talk about what, do you, what needle do you want to move? Mm -hmm. Here's the baseline. Here's what we have. We can do a whole host of comparisons, right, across towns in Connecticut, other towns across the country. Um, and we will at some point have to take that data and make decisions based on what is important to, to the leadership and to the town, right? Um, and we can't make that prediction right now. Um, and it will, it's also why we will need ongoing, I mean, to, <laughs> getting the data and then saying, oh, well, here we are, is not going to do anything for us. So we will have to stay on top of this as a long-term um, goal if we want to move the needle on, say, how many folks are working in Simsbury that can afford to live in Simsbury. Um, we have affordable housing options increasing and now we need to look at daycare options, um, easy access to health care. What does our busing look like in Simsbury? And all those decisions are made, I mean, as you, you guys know this better than I do, in terms of policy and what, pe what, what people say they want and how long that takes in terms of moving that forward. So I think part of that too, and I'm relatively new to this committee, so I do not want to overstep my bounds, but part of that is the RFQ is go, one of the things we're asking for is, um, let me step back. We don't want to get data, sit through and present something that says, aha, right? right. The goal here is um, bring in some experts, collect some data and find out where our baseline is and how we would assess that given several different policy options. And it's not the role of the DEI Council to necessarily propose those policy options, right? That's a role for you and for the town to consider. But if the council, or rather if the, the, the board has deemed right, DEI an important goal, then what does success look like, right? right? And right now, we have no idea. Right, so we have to know where we're starting, and then we can propose several different goals. What does success look like against this measure, or this measure, or this measure, and how would we get there? And then the board could, with town's consent, obviously, or however that policy process plays out, consider several different options to try and achieve it, and then, given a couple of years, we can find out. Right, there's no easy or quick solution to increasing DEI to a level that whatever this town deems it wants it to be, right? right? Again, that's not the council saying, right? Yeah. The state declares racism public health crisis along these five criteria, and this council was kind of uh, great to look into that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so whatever those goals look like, we have to know where we're starting, mm -hmm. and we have to have some plan on how to get there. And so, our role is to help inform you of what mm -hmm. that is. And we're learning from our stakeholder meetings, like. EDC and the Chamber of Commerce and uh, people from Main Street, you know, how do businesses feel about um, what our profile looks like? Mm -hmm. um, does it does it help business, you know, to, to make a business more welcoming, to make, how do customers feel when they walk into your store? We, we hear that anecdotally, you know, but it will be, 
I think it will be helpful to see what that looks like as far as numbers go. We have we get all sorts of anecdotes about grocery stores and mm -hmm. you know drug stores and mm -hmm. I think, Walmart. I mean, maybe and, like, yeah, I think I mean, I'll, I'll, one of the things I'm looking forward to out of you know, multiple things. But I think the data, but the uh, fuel, you know, co cost of fuel, cost of cost of living concerns, and food insecurity, which is one of our ours on there. Mm -hmm. um, I think that can help us to a certain extent frame what some of the work we do with social services. Correct. I mean, sharpen up some of the stuff we do with Kristen's team. Correct. Um, and, or understand better. Are we applying things correctly or do fund things differently? But so that's one of the things I think. Yeah, can, that's a good uh, point. I, I have a complete, I'm going to, as you know me, Sheila, you've known me too long. I'm going to say something. Go ahead. Go ahead. I may not say this the most eloquent, <laughs> eloquently way. I can't even say that word correctly. But um, so, t t just a far look to the side. You know, I think um, this is purely educational from my, my standpoint, and uh, and it could, your answer could be entirely subjective and anecdotal. So that's don't worry. There's no wrong. Um, when I think about so the so when I think about the events and I've missed a lot of events recently uh, in town sponsored events uh, mostly either travel or uh, uh, sports I'm going to miss the Juneteenth event this Sunday because of of, a, of an obligation so I don't see who's turning up to the events mm -hmm. and I'm curious that um, so w are, do you find that the the majority of the folks to this point who turn up are folks who fa who uh, here we go, so in eloquent, yeah, who identify or have found voice under under the umbrella of your organization. Are those the majority of the people that are turning up? Because I think a bigger win would be people who don't find a voice mm -hmm. under that umbrella and who come, right? I mean, right. That to, to a certain extent. So are you having, Are you? is there a transition? So I haven't been to one in the past, I don't know, like the Pride event, I wasn't there, but where it was the audience a one that there, there you go, Chris, making a stereotype, a person that might be identified with that organization, or folks actually who don't have an identity, identity who don't identify by the organization, but are there to learn and share in the experience. So, is it anecdotal at this point, or? I'm going to let Nicole give you an anecdotal event. Uh. <laughs> well, it differs by event, actually, and who who uh, what why people come. How they usually find out about it is through speaker publicity, like when we've done the panels in the library. That's been the, and, and again, it's all been from COVID. So now we're just starting to transition back into real life. Um, the Hispanic Heritage event um, that we had twice now, um, the first event was um, a number of people who are new to the community or at, at the Walker. There was a, a couple of people that worked there and um, some, young, some younger people and some old, um, you know, a little bit less young people, I'll say. <laughs> and they were looking for each other to connect with. Mm -hmm. I want to find other people who, like me, share my heritage and want to cook or mm -hmm. find restaurants near or whatever. So that was interesting. And the same thing happened the second year we had it. It was very interesting. Yeah. Um, there was a young couple who had just moved into the apartments down there. Yep. And they're of Mexican heritage. And they said, you know, one of the comments was, we came just to see if there was anybody else. <laughs> Which is a huge part of this. I mean, I think it's a both and, right? I think what you're getting at is the distinction between are we educating people who may find themselves generally outside of these spheres, or are we just providing an echo chamber for people who find themselves inside? inside yeah. And I think the goal is a little bit of both, right? Because if you're trying to, if you're trying to amplify spaces that are inclusive, offering a space that somebody who isn't often included for someone who isn't often included is is extraordinarily mm -hmm. important mm -hmm. the education piece for somebody who's like i don't want to have anything to do with the pride celebration that piece is also extraordinarily important so our work kind of mm -hmm. tries to do a little a little bit of both and to your i mean again we could probably go on anecdotally about who's who's coming to the events it's something for us to continue to pay attention right. to yeah so i think the bigger win is i hate to say this again when you run out of people who identify with the organization right. that they're maxed out and they're there and the bigger win is when you have multiples of multiple x of those people who don't mm -hmm. and they're sharing the experience so i think right? this That's, sunday will be the test to me see. the first mm -hmm. test because right. a it's the first time we're doing this b most people probably still won't know what it is there'll be signs and stuff but you're gonna have a band on the lawn of the library like somebody's gonna walk by gonna see it. there's be a lot of people have yeah. like if there's people driving yeah. around or whatever they can it's free they can just mm -hmm. come in then 
one of their tables will be education about Juneteenth that they choose to stop by and look at what is it I don't know about it um, what's this flag what are the meaning what is oh gosh that's really thoughtful why they developed that flag it's red white and blue because they're Americans oh okay so I mean the more you get into it like there's an opportunity if people want to take advantage of it but it's not gonna be in their face red velvet cupcakes why are the red velvet cupcakes there'll be a little flyer on the table mm -hmm. Why is the color red important? Why is red food important? So there'll be a chance, and then it will also be filmed by a CTV and photographed by the camera club. So, you know, we will have um, people be able to see it after. Yeah, well, I, I like your comment earlier about the Juneteenth in the sense of, uh, it's a, it's, it truly is a new, it's a, it's a it's an educational campaign for something mm -hmm. new, right? And I, I was talking to my kids about this, that, you know, as a male- to a certain, Demographic, right? Yes, you know, right, and, right. I mean, as a male, I think I know everything about everything, right? So that's, that's <laughs> I, I go into every situation like that, right? Yeah. So, uh, so it was like, and, and generally, as a you know, you, as a parent, you, you've you've been through education, you've been through an education system that sort of cut covers all the bases of, of history to a certain extent, and you think that you can probably you know help the kids walk through whatever module they're going through because you've been through it. This is the first one where my kids have given me far more information about right. the event or the, the significance of cool. the situation that I did and I have. Well, and we're learning too. I mean, yeah. as we hear these things, um, we asked some people who came to our program, you know, who were of an ethnic uh, group, what was the first thing you noticed when you came to Simsbury? And they said, the grocery store. And we said, well, what about the grocery what store? The and she said, yeah. well, she said, why is it that there's an international food aisle, mm -hmm. and in the international food aisle, there's you know Chinese food, Thai food, whatever. She goes, but Italian food is not in the international food aisle. And I just looked at her like, because ah. <laughs> you have a whole aisle that's Italian, you know, <laughs> pasta, pasta sauces, all this, but that doesn't say international food, but the taco mix says international food. Mm. And she's like, well, why is that? Mm. And we all just looked at each other and went, mm -hmm. uh, uh, why is that? <laughs> you know, that's- I think that follows for me every grocery store. But that's something that, you know, right. even though you do know everything, you've probably never thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. do, we, so, do we have any more questions from the board or Eric, just so we can like- Hey, hey you guys. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes. I'm, uh, I'm you know, coming in from the ether. Um, hi, everybody. It's, I just wanted to say, as, as liaison to um, the DEI Council, um, I'm glad that you presented to us tonight, and I hope that as this work continues, because I know it is ongoing, that you'll continue to come, you know, with these periodic updates so that the board stays engaged. Um, and, you know, it made me think about how, um, you know, change is hard. Um, even, even good change is hard. And I'm really, I think you're doing this the right way. You're engaging all the right stakeholders. You are, you know, you're gathering um, data, and you're going to be able to put a story together that I, I, I am confident and I, and I hope is going to be able to drive the change um, that we want to see. Um, but I think being able to tell that story is going to be really important because change is never easy, even when it's a positive thing. Okay. Thanks, Eric. Okay, thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Okay, so um, we're going to move to the first selectman's report, which I'm going to pretty much chop into like a tiny bit. Um, and people can read it online, but I talked about um, the gun violence that just happened um, because it was after our meeting and um, how we were all impacted by Sandy Hook, all those of us that kind of watched that happen. Um, and to the people that are hurting in, the, in our community, we have a social services department, guidance counselors, friends, family, anyone you're comfortable talking to about that. I think we should all be diligent looking at warning signs of potential acts of violence that may be preventable. And I did add that I have confidence in our police department that they would do whatever is necessary to protect us. So just wanted to mention that, that there's a lot going on in zoning around ADUs and cannabis, and please pay attention and show up and speak up and listen um, because those are very important issues to to our community. Um, I did a little bragging in here on something I just earned. I'm not mentioning it. Um, we have the Accessibility Parking Month. I know Amber's going to talk about that, but I do want to just talk about um, if, you, if you have a mom that uses a walker, you know how important it is to have space between cars. Um, and that's just my, my personal experience. 
Um, I talked about the DEI celebration, that it is Father's Day. Um, but, you know, I, my husband will be golfing, so he won't care what I do on Father's Day. Um, I want to thank the Flower Bridge Committee for a beautiful um, Burgers on the Bridge. It was just a really great night. Um, we did hear some concerns after the road race about parking and traffic, and we're kind of talking those through a little bit. I do want to say we sadly lost the Simsbury duck race. We came in second place. Our duck was out in front and then the wind spun it around and then we flipped over and we came in second into the net. So next year we're going to apply lessons learned and we're going to kick butt on that one. And I also want to thank the Board of Ed for inviting me to the graduation Friday night. It was really a nice night. Um, I, my kids graduated in 08 and 11, so it was kind of nostalgic. Um, but the speeches were really nice. And I, I did end with the world is... A tough place right now we're all facing challenges but these kids seemed ready to get out there and take it on and i just hope that we can all do the same thing so that's it for me i'm going to turn it over to maria for her town manager's report great thank you uh, good evening everyone um just a couple of quick points under our coronavirus update um hartford county did recently transition to the cdc community level for medium um so that does change their recommendations for masking and things of that nature um, we have provided a link to the cdc explanation for those various uh, levels of community transmission for um, anyone who might be interested in that and I also just want to thank everybody for their patience um, with us, particularly during the month of May. Um, when we experience um, high levels of community transition, we also see that translate into our workforce. And for the month of May, it was actually our second highest month of positive cases amongst our workforce during the entirety of the pandemic. So um, again, we, you know, in some instances might have had slight delays or needed to reschedule for non-emergency matters and just really wanted to thank everybody for their patience with us uh, during May. And a couple of quick items under department news and notes. Um, Culture, Parks and Recreation is asking our residents to please remember to clean up after your pets um, when you are visiting our parks and trails. Um, this does continue to be an issue for us. And um, we do ask that you please take your waste bags home with you or dispose of them in an appropriate receptacle. Um, from the library, um, this is a great service um, our staff is providing. They have resumed providing passport um, application appointments. Um, so you can contact the library information desk to schedule that. Um, we are unable to process passport renewals, so this is only for new applications. And from Public Works, um, they had a very successful uh, regional household hazardous waste collection event this past Saturday. We had over 600 households participate from our region, uh, including Simsbury, Avon, Canton, Granby, and Farmington and Suffield. Uh, the next collection event will be on October 15th, but a big thanks to Tom Roy, Kevin Clemens, and their team for, for hosting that successful event. Did you wear a hazmat suit? <laughs> We did good. We, we, oh, sorry. The crews do it. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if you've been through it, but it's a pretty organized event. Yes, it is. It's very impressive. Yeah. Yes. And uh, from social services, um, we will be offering a free babysitting course for youth uh, in our community ages 11 to 17. Um, that's going to be sponsored in conjunction with the American Red Cross. Uh, the one-day course will be on Monday, June 20th. Um, it focuses on first aid, making good decisions, and communicating with parents uh, amongst responsibilities of babysitting. Um, folks can register their youth by contacting social services. Um, space is limited, um, and participants will need to attend for the full day. Um, we'll also be um, providing a certificate for those who complete the course and lunch as well. And from the town clerk's office, this is some really uh, wonderful news I'm excited to share. Our town clerk, Trish Monroe, um, passed her town clerk certification exam. So congratulations are in order for her. She is now officially a certified Connecticut town clerk. Um, in order to accomplish this, she had to sit through a number of classroom training modules and take a final examination for that. Um, she's just been a true asset to our office since joining our team. We're really proud of her. Um, and especially since June uh, is the month to register your dogs, um, we would encourage Encourage folks to stop by and say congratulations. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, now, oh, now let's see. Do we have any liaison or subcommittee reports? I'll point to Heather. Anything you want to report? Um, I do not at the moment. Okay, I'm gonna. Amber? I'll talk about the parking. Oh, okay. Under, under oh, that under section. The agenda. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Chris. Yeah. Anything? Eric, have any reports? No. Okay. Did can you hear me? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't know if we can hear. Okay, so then we're going to move on to selectman action. Um, and the first item up is the proposed amendment to the solid waste ordinance. And I believe we are ready to 
do, do you have anything more to say on this? I don't think we're going to table it, right? I think we're going to move. So I'm going to read the motion. This is, I think we've been through this a few times. To move effective June 13th, um, 2022, to adopt the proposed revisions to the Solid Waste Ordinance, Chapter 133, as presented, which shall be effective 21 days after the publication in a newspaper having circulation within the town of Simsbury. Further move to authorize a summary of the adopted ordinance be published. Anybody want to move that? So moved. Thank Second. you. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, that aye. motion. Thank you. <laughs> that motion passes. Um, the next up is the proposed transfer station fee schedule. And I'm going to have um, Mr. Roy come on up. Tough fact to follow after that presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this one's actually um, pretty straightforward. Paynes is, operates our transfer station, and the way they are paid is actually through the fees that they collect for when any of the residents bring their materials in there. Uh, based on the fact that our contract was bid three years ago, and they are faced with higher disposal costs, higher trans um, transportation costs associated with fuel increases, they are looking to make a modest modification to our fee structure. Um, looking it over, it seems very reasonable. We are still charging the same or less than transfer stations in the region, and we are not putting out town staff to do the work. So it's very um, equitable to the town. And this is just in relation to the bulky waste at the... Um, That's exactly right. It's the old Simsbury dump. dump. Yeah, the <laughs> dump. Yes. Okay. I didn't realize that that was no longer... Like, the things had changed over there. Um, anybody have any questions on this? Okay, so move effective um, July 1st, 2022 to adopt the bulky waste transfer station fee schedule as presented. So move. Thank you, Heather. So move. Thank I'm second from Eric. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, that motion carries. Thank um, thanks, Tom. Thank you. Uh, next up is the Accessible Parking Awareness Month, and I'm going to turn that over to Deputy First Selectman Amber Abuel and the Commission Aging and Disability Commission Liaison. Oh, thank you. Um, as uh, Wendy just mentioned, June uh, historically has been designated as our Accessible Parking Awareness Month. We've been doing this since 2012, and it really is to just remind people uh, that even if it's just for a few minutes as you run inside a store, you should not be parking in the um, handicap mark parking spots, but also being aware, uh, as Wendy mentioned, about the space around the spots, which is equally important for people that are using walkers or wheelchairs. They need to have that space. That's why those hash marks are there. So that is part of the um, handicap parking um space and we are also coordinating with the police department our fines for illegally parking in accessible parking spaces has uh, increased so the maximum fine can uh, be as high as 250 dollars and it can and the minimum is 50 dollars and so we just really want to take this time to shed a little light on this and and remind people to just please be aware and consider it yeah. Do you want to uh, you want to read the motion? Oh, sure. Okay. <laughs> so move effective June 13th, 2022 to designate June of 2022 as Accessible Parking Awareness Month in the town of Simsbury. I'm going okay. to move that because I never get to move anything. <laughs> I'll move it. <laughs> Anybody want to second it? Anybody second? S second. <laughs> okay. It's been seconded. And all those in favor? Aye. Aye. So I'm moved. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> like mixing things up a bit here. Okay. Um, okay so the the next item is going to is um, reappointing Mike Barry as emergency management director effective July first, twenty twenty two, and I will let M Maria speak to Mike and his and his skill set. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so under our charter, uh, the position of civil preparedness director, which is a bit of a, a dated term, um, does require um, appointment um, from the Board of Selectmen following my recommendation. Um, what's interesting is that it also states um, that it would be a term of two years. So it's hard to believe that it's now been about two years since um, our previous AMD, Kevin Kowalski, uh, retired from service. Wow. Um, and I just uh, cannot say enough positive things about Mike. Mike, thank you for joining us. Oh. Uh, this evening. <laughs> you can't see us, but hi, Mike. 
You're very welcome. Thank you. He has, thank you so much. He has served our community with such care and dedication um, over the last two years, really was such an important member of our team to help us with so many of our efforts in response to the pandemic. We also encountered a number of very challenging storm events. Um, as you might recall, we had Storm Isaias create quite a bit of damage with significant power outages. We've had flooding. Um, whether it's a storm event, the pandemic, other emergency management related events. Um, again, Mike has just demonstrated an incredible amount of knowledge um, in the field. And again, has just really just taken such care of our community. Um, he's been a great member of the team and I, I just, I can't say enough um, positive things about him and just really appreciate his service. We, we all appreciate you, Mike. And we, we did, uh, I just wanna comment on the, um, the, the test kit distribution that was where I met you and that was with working with the town um, DPW and Tom and that whole crew that was an amazing um, organized event so that was my first introduction to you <laughs> do you want to well, say something? thank you very much but uh, just know that this is a uh, total team event and I'm just a small part of the uh, whole dynamic of the town which is fantastic so I appreciate the kind words but just know that there's a whole uh, team of people it's not just me Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Anybody else? Any comments? Okay. So we're going to move effective July 1st, 2022 to reappoint Michael Berry as the emergency management director for the town of Simsbury. This designation shall remain in effect until revised, rescinded, or Mr. Berry's separation from service, whichever comes first. So moved. Okay. Chris? Second. Heather, second that. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, Mike, welcome back to the to the fold. Okay. Um, thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the tax refund requests move effective June 13th, 2022 to approve the presented tax refunds in the amount of $764.61 and to authorize town manager Maria E. Capriola to execute the tax refunds. So moved. Thank you. Second. Second. I'm Heather. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. That passes. <laughs> Giving a little hint. Okay. So this one is a mouthful. Authorize the Board of Education to apply for a Connecticut school construction grant for the partial roof replacement projects at Terrafield Elementary School and Central Elementary School, referral of the projects to the Public Building Committee, and authorization of preparation of schematic drawings and specifications. Um, Maria, do you want to take this one on and Sure, I'll, I'll start. Okay. Um, and I do believe that we were going to have um, somebody from the Board of Ed who was going to be available for questions mm -hmm. in the event that um, that you have any. But you are probably familiar uh, with the series of resolutions. Um, in the past, we had to do this for the Latimer Lane project as well as the Henry James renovation. When we have school projects that have um, a portion of it that's eligible for reimbursement by the state, um, they do require a series of motions as we are heading into that project. Um, so these particular roof replacement projects are um, eligible for a certain amount of reimbursement from the state. So again, these are required motions of us uh, by the state. And then Jason um, oh, is hi, here Jason. and available in the event that you all have any questions about uh, these motions. Right. And these were these are in the budget for this year. I mean, the, the two roof replacements. So it's just it, right. Yeah. They are budgeted projects. That's mm -hmm. correct. Okay. Any questions for Jason? Okay, Jason joined. So just, can I read the three and then just do them as a group, right? Sure. Okay, so. Okay, I should do it. Is it simplistically, is it just 15%? Is that what it is? That's what the, mm -hmm. the program is? Jason, were you able to hear the question from Chris? I, I can't hear. Okay, it's not. Do you, I'm just curious if it's just a, is this a flat 15 percent that's the program you get 15 percent back on these from the state oh, that what it, it, de is? it depends on the project um it depends on the type of project uh renovate like new mm -hmm. um there so there are um different reimbursement levels depending okay. on the mm -hmm. type of project and the nature of the renovation okay. i'm just looking for something I, I just is it something easily you can sort of forecast for for future so there is a schedule there that's yeah. known okay that's fine all right I'm sorry, I missed the first part of this. What was the question? No, it's fine. That's, Jason, we're all set. I was able to answer the question. <laughs> what kind of pizza do you like? <laughs> okay. All right, thank you for <laughs> Okay, I'm, I'm going to read the three motions.
and then we can just approve them as a as, as um, resolve resolve that the board of selectmen authorizes the town of Simsbury Board of Ed to apply to the Commissioner of Education to accept or reject grants for the Terrafield Elementary School and Central Elementary School partial roof replacement projects. Be resolved that the board of selectmen hereby establishes the permanent public building committee as the building committee to the proposed Terrafield Elementary School and Central Elementary School partial roof replacement and be it resolved that the Board of Selectmen authorizes the preparation of schematic drawings and outline specifications for the proposed Terrafield Elementary School and Central Elementary School partial roof replacement projects. Somebody can move that. I'll move. <laughs> Thank you, Heather. I'll There's second. A, Amber, second that. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, that, aye. Ca that carries. Oh, now we're up to the fun stuff. The supplemental appropriation for the golf equipment purchase. So I see Tom's on here and Maria's here and I'm gonna turn it over to the experts again. Sure, would you like to take this, Tom? Sure, sure. Uh, for those of you who are familiar, we have the golf surcharge maintenance fund. Mm -hmm. That fund was set up in, I believe, 2016 to cover expenses similar to this. Um, the mower that we would be taking offline is a 2006, it's a Jacobson model. Uh, the rest of our model, the rest of our mowers are, are Toros. Um, and this Jacobson is very difficult to get parts for. It's currently our backup mower. Um, in case the main, in case the Toro we have now goes down, uh, the one we have a, an opportunity to buy here is, is a very lightly used mower. Uh, it's in great condition. Our staff has has already inspected it, and um, it would become our frontline mower with our current mower becoming the backup. And uh, you know we had had intended to replace this in five to six years out, but that was under. Uh, the previous superintendent's capital plan and, and this, uh, the current equipment is failing quicker than we had expected. And as you all know, there's a very difficult uh, time getting parts for these for mowers right now, older equipment right now. So we'd appreciate your support and uh, moving this forward. Sounds like a great deal. It is a great deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. I, anybody have any questions on that? No, 100% okay. support yep. this. Right. Okay, so move effective June 13, 2022 to approve a supplemental appropriation for the purchase of a golf, equip golf course mower in the amount of 29500 with funding from the golf maintenance equipment surcharge account. So moved. Thank you. I'll second. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, that aye. passes. So go get your mower. <laughs> um, okay, so this one, it, this was a kind of a new ad. Um, the supplemental appropriation for the Meadowood Barn demolition. I'm going to turn this over to Amy and Maria to explain um, what's going on here. Sure, sure. So this was a request um, that came to us from the Board of Finance. Um, you may recall, uh, since we acquired uh, the Meadowood property, we did have two barns that took um, uh, an unexpected turn for the for the worse, um, and they were deemed to be in unsafe conditions by our building official as well as a structural engineer, and they did need to uh, be demolished. Um, that was not initially planned as part of the original scope of the project. Um, we did have some budgeted funds within the capital project um, to cover. Um, some temporary stabilization work that did in fact occur. Um, and then just based on the overall um, expenses in the project, our bond council did say while we could charge those expenses to the original capital project, um, so we don't have to go back out to referendum, we could simply um, create a separate, separate capital project to cover the expenses that we had to incur for the demolition work. Um, legal expenses were also um, quite complex. Uh, it was a, a rather complex um, transaction. So uh, again, this is to, to clean up. Typically, you might see this again during something such as um, a capital project closeout. But again, the Board of Finance had asked if we could please you know, take care of this at this time. Um, and we are uh, recommending um, that this be funded um, through the uh, Capital Reserve Fund. OK, so this was basically budgeted um, um, the barns were included in the original capital request, but we kind of it kind of went over a little bit. So this is to kind of just clean up what happened um, to account for that that money. That's correct. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any questions? Okay. Move effective June 13, 2022, to approve an appropriation for the Meadowood barn demolition and legal expenses in the amount of forty one thousand dollars as presented, and to create a capital project for the Meadowood barn demolition. Moved. Thank you. Second, anybody? I'll second. Okay, thanks, Amber. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, so that motion passes. Um, so now we're getting into the next couple items are, um, I'm going to take the first one is a supplemental appropriation request 
for the housing authority. This is getting into um, kind of use of ARPA funding. So I was just going to give a little background. You know, we use a lot of the our, most of our ARPA funds for capital projects for the betterment of the community. Um, and we also had a few projects that were um, not ready at the budget time, like the Farmington Valley Health District. Amber had done a lot of due diligence with the housing authority to get what the needs were from them. Um, so this first one is on the housing authority needs to get some budgeted items for them. And in the packet, there is some, some prioritization items and what the, uh, the finance subcommittee decided, you know, again, with Amber being a great liaison to housing, um, came to us and we approved and all agreed that we would give $100,000 to pay for some of these priorities. priorities. Um, we also will have some sort of follow up to prove, demonstrate that the expenses were used for the work that we're, we're having done here. Um, but um, Amber, do you want to add anything to this? Um, I would just add that, um, you know, we're, we're very thankful for all the work that the Housing Authority does. Um, it, it helps service some of, um, you know, our more vulnerable population here in Simsbury. And the Housing Authority has been under tremendous pressure from the state um, with um, having funding cut. And the Housing Authority is also responsible. You know, they do not receive funding. Um, for capital improvements that need to be made, you know, to the the apartments themselves. So that is something that the housing authority just has to fund out of out of its operations. And there are a number of of uh, items that need to be taken care of to get the apartments um, to just do some some long. Uh, long time needed work there, uh, including electrical panels, heat pumps, and, and a lock system. So a lot of this really, uh, it, like the heat pumps and the air circulation really fits with a lot of, you know, what happens during COVID and it kind of, you know, has to do with air quality. And um, we, we just need to make sure that that the apartments can be in, in as good a condition um, as possible. So I'm glad that we're able to help them meet some of these needs and uh you know we have more arpa funds coming um through a second tranche and and i'm sure the housing authority will put this uh investment to good use and we can kind of keep monitoring where things are and um and and see if there's any money you know before it's all gone that that can maybe help help you guys get um further down the line with your renovations so, so, so so it's safe to say that it's 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 quite possible. For, I'm, I'm in support of this, but I'm trying to lead the witness. Uh, the safe to say that some aspects of this of the projects that this money would be going to, some aspects of it would probably come back around to us in some form or fashion as far as funding in some other some other point down the road. Is that safe to say at all? Because you, you, the money's coming from in house, the renovations Sorry, money. Yes, you are. I'm asking a question from the experts. Christine is the executive director of the Central Housing Authority, and I'm the chairman of the mm -hmm. commissioners. Yeah. So, well, I'm not really sure. Yeah, I don't, yeah. So, so the the monies that the, the this, these monies are going towards projects that you've identified that are sorely right. in need of of, yeah. of renovation or restoration, whichever it may be. The money for that project was it was Al is uh, mentioned in here that the monies from it would come from from what otherwise it would come from rents it would come from another program it would come from the fund balance fund, yeah. fund balance right our so, only other way to get funds is through um, operations like the small cities grant program um, several years ago we did get a small cities grant which allowed us to do rent, um, some repairs on the Virginia Connolly residence you know the roof the road um, making more accessible entrances in the courtyards and the um, solar panels on the roof of Virginia. But, but ultimately, the, the, those the entities. That's are, our only way to get any money. The, the but the entities that you guys that you guys run and support, mm -hmm. at some point in their life cycle, we do provide. We do provide funding for some aspects of them, do we not? No, no, we no. Don't. We There's not a dollar from this town that goes no, to the Virginia no, no, no. economy. We just had a tour a before this. <laughs> I know it's at five o'clock today. I missed that. We all the so only um, a lot of what about the doors the that we replaced? The town provides uh, plowing services, okay. so we have monetized that number as we have, you know, tried to identify those costs. Um, the housing authority pays a pilot tax mm -hmm. to the town. Um, 
those doors that were replaced, who paid for those doors? Did we, re did we do some? Yeah, so there, there's a couple of things. So um, we provide some IT services. Right. Uh, we yeah. also provide trauma mm -hmm. filing services. We also uh, make the payment on their behalf for their sewer use fee. Um, so that's sort of, again, sort of direct dollars that come out of our operating budget on an annual basis mm -hmm. to support the operation. In terms of capital, um, as Cheryl mentioned, the small cities program, um, the town has to be the applicant, um, and then we are a pass through to them. So okay, um, well, I stand that, corrected. I apologize. Yeah, I thought we, I thought we, I thought, I thought, I thought, I thought no ongoing funding from the town mm -hmm. in, in any regular basis. Right. So when we apply for a small cities grant, as Greg said, it's the town who is the applicant. And, and that do, that takes work. That's, sure. that's staff time and spend. But kind that's of, our only. Effort. I thought for sure we'd pay for some doors a couple of years ago. I think <laughs> we'd be thinking of the small cities grant. Okay. No. Nonetheless, yeah, I, I think I, I just don't think it's a. I think it's a it, it, because this has been through the finance subcommittee and they they hundred they hundred percent support the usage of this these funds for that entity. I think that that's all I needed to hear. Heather, did you have a comment? I, I do. The small the small cities grant. Um, what kind of funding? amount does that does that um, usually provide and is it something that you can apply for more than once and is it project specific how does that work um, all of those things yeah. <laughs> yeah. and it's con it's competitive so you're competing with like she said it's a it's through the town so it's the town getting the grant even though we may be the recipient so it's it's a competitive bid. So the state will say there's you know ten million dollars available for housing authorities this year. So every housing authority sure. puts in an application. We have the, we have the best pack. We need the best pack to put forth. And then so you know it's whatever you get. You don't always get what you asked right. for. So if you ask for a million dollars, you might get five hundred thousand dollars, and then you just. Are we are we always applying though, or do we, we not have? Applying. So we are, so we apply every time it's an op. We got one large one, as I mentioned earlier, and then we got a smaller one, mm -hmm. and then we got totally shut out. Right. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. And, and I I would like to say that like the total amount that you submitted that's on your priority list right now for some of the capital improvements is almost seven hundred thousand dollars, and we're granting you a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars to be able to take care of the top most emergent things that need done so we're not we're, we're not really coming close to you know uh, I would those, like those to electrical panels were identified on an audit um, both by the state and by our insurance company so we're now paying extra insurance because mm -hmm. of those electric panels so it has really become somewhat of a an urgent matter to yeah that was explained to us yeah. um, earlier today and I just want to say I um, we really appreciated the tour so much, and it was really, uh, you know, it's very evident you know, seeing the need there. Um, uh, and these, uh, you know, most of our residents are, particularly in Virginia Connolly, have lived in Simsbury their whole lives. These are not people who just showed up, you know, to live in Virginia Connolly. There are people live, who live there who now find themselves in circumstances where they can avail themselves of our services. and. We are grateful that we are able to provide those services, and, and and we feel like we've done as much as we possibly can with the limited funds we have available. Um, you know, every we can't just go and raise rent. <laughs> you know, I mean, right. to do that, we have to go through a process with the state. Our budget goes to the state, and they have to approve it. So um, these things don't just just happen, and obviously the people who, who rent from us have limited means to be in so okay all right so um so the next step after this if we move it forward it'll go to the board of finance um i'm going to move effective june 13 2022 to approve a supplemental appropriation for funding for the simsbury Hous housing authority in the amount of a hundred thousand dollars so moved thank you a second um second happy. Too late. <laughs> Aaron, you You're on a delay, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe Heather spoke too softly. Sorry. Um, um, hey, Wendy, yeah? Wendy, real quick. Before before we vote, just one thing I wanted to get in. I know sure. I've said once before, but I, I really think there is really no more appropriate investment of our ARPA dollars than what we're talking about right now. And I, I hope that we're able to contribute um, another uh, another set of funds during the second tranche. Okay. okay. Um, so we, we're just waiting to vote. We have motion and a second. And so the, all those in favor um, say aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Motion Thank carries. You. Thanks, Eric, for the comment.
Okay, so there's there you go. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Amy, Amy will give you your check <laughs> as, you, as you leave the room. <laughs> Thank you, You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all very much for coming. Yes. Okay, I'm trying to get more notice next time. <laughs> okay, so the next item, I'm going to go through this, and this has a long history. Amy, I think we're probably the only ones from the history of this. Um, this this was a this was a, one of our first projects with the ARPA funding. This is about um, an appropriation for 501c3 nonprofit. When we first started with ARPA back in a year ago, um, we were really limited in how we were going to use it. We were trying to figure out how to use it, and one of the ideas was to have a grant program for nonprofits to help them recover, get, you know, with the pandemic. That was our original ARPA work group, Sean and Jackie and I. And then we were going to move it forward in January and there were some issues or we needed to clean up some stuff. And then the final rule came out, which totally turned things upside down on how you could use the funding. And it was, we're trying to keep in the spirit of using the funding, but it made it a little less stringent. So um, we've been looking at this. This was another one in that list along with the business program. What this program um, right now is what well, we're coming to first ask for the amount of funding and we're like some input on this we have um we're setting aside one hundred and fifty thousand dollars out of the first tranche which we've already planned for and allowing 501c3 nonprofits to apply with an application that was created for originally for the first program um where the um, 501c3s can you can you can see it, but they say their need, what they're planning to do with the money, COVID related. But we've kind of made it more recovery since we're, we're I believe we're recovering from COVID at this this point in time, and they can apply for up to ten thousand um, dollars. The original application had a lot of it was not subjected subjective at all. It was going to go through Amy. Now what we're planning to do is take um, have a window of a month, open it up for applications. They can apply for up to ten thousand dollars. Those are going to kind of get screened through the finance subcommittee for, um, well, for Amy, for the what's on the application, and then it will come through the finance subcommittee. Then we're hoping to deliver a packet to the board of selectmen where we look at these and hopefully we can, they all meet the need, they all pass subjective criteria, and we can award these funds to recover or um, pay for expenses from COVID. Um, a couple things that we, is not included in here. The application is included in here. Um, what's not included in here, and we that's still a next step, is to figure out what kind of follow-up we want to do. Um, we I think we want to just get a blessing from Bob D on this to make sure that um, the process that we're going through, if we need you know follow-up commitment like with housing we're going to ask to see that they use the money appropriately um, so that's kind of a missing piece here but what i'm hoping is by the next meeting I, what i'm looking to, to do here is approve that we can move forward with this program and then at the the, the next meeting um, announce the program with all the correct forms um, after it passes council's approval and then go forward from here so I wanted to get input. I know Amber and Heather and I are on this, but if Eric and Chris have any feedback or questions um, that they'd like to ask. Uh, I can't, I'm, I'm distracted too much by Eric's. Uh, uh, Loud his, swishing? His, yeah, his texting coming in and out. Eric, yeah. you gotta turn that off. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm, thank you for, okay. I got enough information. Okay, thank you. Eric, you got any questions? No, wow. <laughs> was that back telling me to to, to Who is it? it's, i think it's the owl for some is it this evening. okay anyways i don't know okay so so let's that was easy um maybe i said way too much um move effective june 13th 2022 to approve a supplemental appropriation for funding for the 501c3 nonprofit profit grant program in the amount of one hundred and fifty thousand dollars I'll make it a motion. Okay, Heather made the motion. Second. Chris seconded that. All those in favor say aye. 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 And um, thanks to Sean who helped initiate this back last June. Um, I, we're, I, was, I was just Jackie. saying, I think it's, we, we were on this path. So I don't know that we should be, you know, so we were. Okay. This is a resolution of that path. Okay. Um, and yeah, so the next item, we're getting into some job classifications that have gone through the personnel subcommittee. These I'm going to um, turn over to Maria if she wants to talk about the property appraiser classification to start. 
Sure. So you may recall in the current year budget, we had a uh, temporary part-time um, position uh, property appraisal work. Uh, but given the labor market for appraisers um, in Connecticut, particularly in the municipal space, um, we were not successfully able to recruit um, somebody part-time temporary. So the budget does uh, for upcoming for July 1 um, does in fact include uh, the funding for this position to be uh, full time. So uh, we did uh, propose to the, the personal subcommittee the official creation of the classification of property appraiser. Uh, we also presented a job description and we had also done a market analysis um, and recommended a pay rate for July 1st. Um, the intent would be um, you know, for us to move forward relatively quickly with proceeding with the recruitment um, since the funds will be available to us uh, after July 1. Do you want to add anything, Amy? Okay, and this was the position that we, we could potentially or could help us get three million dollars, um, right? So this, so hopefully, if there's any assessors listening out there, they want to come work for the town of Simsbury. Now's your chance um, to move. Anybody else have any questions? No. Okay. Move effective June 13, 2022 to create the classification of property appraiser and to approve the proposed job description description as presented. Further move to establish an hourly rate of pay for the position between 3709 to 4432 an hour. So moved. Thank you. Amber? Anybody second? second. Um, Chris second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Okay. Now we're up to the revisions to the information technology director job description. So another one that's been through personnel subcommittee. Yeah, that's correct. So um, the current um, job description, um, the position is still technically titled data processing manager, which in and of itself is, is quite dated. Uh, and the job description had not been updated in over 25 years. So uh, my office had been working very closely with Rick Bozzano, who is our IT manager, um, to really take a good housekeeping look at the job descriptions in that department. Um, the union was also supportive of the proposed changes. Um, so we would both like to update that job description description, but also to update the job title to, to better be reflective of current terminology and what he does. Uh, he is a department head. He's a very important member of our team. So we would like to update that job title to information technology director. That's a pretty good title, I have to yeah. say, because it's my title. <laughs> um, so, um, okay, anybody have any questions? Um, so move effective June 13, 2022 to approve the revised job title and job description for the information technology director position as presented. So moved. Thanks, Heather. I'll second. Amber, second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, that passes. Aye. aye. Thanks, Eric. Okay, and the youth and family social worker classification. This was the item. This was, I just was going to emphasize that this was the temporary uh, model. What was it called? Not model. I forgot the word we were using. The um, pilot? Pilot, thank you, yeah. Um, that we, were, we, we discussed at the budget. Um, it doesn't state that in here. I brought that up. But um, it will state that in the in the job opening. Um, Maria, do you want to talk about this position? Sure. Um, so this will round out um, the remainder of our positions that were newly created and authorized for July 1st. Um, again, I think we're very fortunate in that we have a good internal comparison um, with our community uh, social worker position. Um, again, we're also very fortunate in Connecticut that many communities do have established youth service bureaus. So um, we have prepared a job description um, and also um, have recommended a rate of pay for the position um, that would take effect on July 1st. Um, this position would be exempt um, therefore we are presenting the salary data to you on an annualized basis as opposed to an hourly basis okay any questions on this one okay move effective june 13 2022 to create the classification of youth and family social worker and to approve the proposed job description as presented further move to establish a salary rate of pay for the position between 72059 to 86119 so moved thank you amber second second um, Chris, second that. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. okay, so that, that position is on its way. Um, now we get to the more, even more fun stuff. Um, the successor collective bargaining agreement between the town and the CSEA clerical library secretarial employees. Oops, I'm going to turn that over to Maria. Great, thank you. Um, so um, we have reached an agreement, uh, tentative agreement with our 
uh, clerical union um, for a successor collective bargaining agreement. Um, the union's ratification meeting did occur on June 10th and they did vote to ratify the agreement. Um, because this was negotiated in good faith, um, I would certainly recommend and, and um, uh, recommend to you all that we move forward with having this body ratify the agreement this evening. Um, a few highlights, it is a four year agreement in duration. The general wage increases um, are comparable to uh, our other internal groups. Um, you'll recall in total we have uh, six bargaining groups with what's on the agenda for this evening. We'll reach a total of five of our six groups having um, settlements for, for the duration of, of these years. Um, it's also consistent with what our non-union staff has been receiving. Mm -hmm. And it's also consistent with our external data. So you might recall uh, CCM mm -hmm. does track that. There's a difference between arbitrated settlements and negotiated settlements. And during this time frame, we were seeing negotiated settlements, generally speaking, um, coming between about two and a quarter and, and 2.35 in most years. We were able to successful, uh, successfully negotiate um, some changes to uh, benefits. Um, in particular, we were able to increase the vesting period for retiree medical insurance from five years to 10 years of service. Uh, we also, for employees um, who are enrolled in the defined benefit plan, uh, those employees who were hired uh, prior to June of, two, I'm sorry, uh, July 1 of 2013 um, had a much lower employee contribution than other groups. So uh, they will be moving to increase uh, to 6% of salary, um, followed by 7% of salary on July 1st. Um, the group did agree to the health insurance plan management uh, changes uh, for both pharmacy and medical management um, that were negotiated with the other groups. They also agreed to the medical insurance co-pays that the other groups agreed to. And then we did spend considerable time um, doing what I would call, again, as housekeeping um, changes throughout the document, reflecting changes in form of government. Um, also, the contracts, for particularly for CSCA, just hadn't really been looked at in a long time in terms of positions that have changed. I mean, there's, there were just so many housekeeping items that were needed, um, but we really did work through that with, with the uh, bargaining group. So this covers 17 full-time employees and 19 part-time employees. Um, Melissa uh, has done a very nice job for us. She's unfortunately not able to be here with us this evening, but did a very nice job preparing the cost analysis that you all are, are accustomed to seeing, um, which has been attached uh, for your reference. Mm -hmm. um, questions, comments by anybody? Um, and so this is like, this contract is fairly in line with other state let the, you know, in this municipality is at the same um, type of union or this union, correct? Uh, the settlement is, I would say, fairly consistent um, with what we've negotiated with our other bargaining groups within okay. the organization. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the question that I always comes up is the DB versus DC plan that we're mm -hmm. still offering mm -hmm. um, a pension benefit plan. Um, and there's been question as to the financial, like, but I think the work's been done that both are equally beneficial to the employee and the town is that yeah and we'll go over some of this this evening um, under our collective bargaining strategy okay. um, but our actuaries um, did do a thorough analysis as part of the negotiation process for this group um, for the three CSCA groups um, some number of years ago it was negotiated that employees would have the option to participate in the DB or the DC plan um, the employees hired after 2016 who do opt to participate in the DB plan do have a relatively high contribution that's okay. not common it's 10 percent mm -hmm. of their of their salary um, so their contributions are at such a rate, um, it's actually not in our financial interest to close the DB plan off to the groups. Okay. Okay, that's a, that's a loud ear hurting. Um, one thing I did like that I saw in here, I just want to comment, was section 5.8, that the work from home, that was a new, that looked like it was a new section in here. Mm -hmm. Um, just that there is an option for remote work. I thought that was, you know, looking ahead. And I was surprised by the, um, that the Board of Selectmen has to approve a leave of absence over two months or something like that, right? Just yeah. thought that was good. <laughs> we get to do that. Okay. All right, so let me get back to the motion here. Um, so move effective June, this is the motion for option A, correct? That's written in yes, here. Yes, right, okay. so you have three options and I would recommend, sorry, I'm just gonna scroll back up. 
Which is what that you yeah. right, we're going to vote to authorize the town manager to execute the proposed yeah, successor okay. collective bargaining agreement, which is option A. That mm-hmm. is what I would be recommending. And um, the motion uh, here presented to you reflects option A. OK, so move effective June 13, 2022, to authorize town manager Maria Capriola to execute the proposed successor collective bargaining agreement between the town of Simsbury and the CSEA clerical library and secretarial employees July 1st, 2019 to June 30th, 2023, which will enter into effect retroactively from July 1st, 2019 and expire on June 30th, 2023. So somebody wants to move. So moved. Thank you. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. So that motion passes. Now we're on the um, so this, the next one is the collective bargaining agreement between the CSEA town and the supervisors group. Yeah, that's correct. So um, this next uh, proposed contract, again, um, I think the highlights are consistent with what we just reviewed. So I, w- I will not repeat that yeah. uh, this evening. Um, this is a much smaller group of our staff members. Um, this includes some of our division heads, as well as a few of our department directors. Um, this currently covers a group of eight employees. Um, But again, the highlights are, um, I think, consistent with what we just covered. Again, many thanks to Melissa. She also prepared a very good contract cost analysis, and that's attached as well. Okay. Any questions from anyone? Okay. So option A is what's written here. I'm going to read option A and move effective June 13, 2022 to authorize town manager Maria Capriola to execute the proposed successor collective bargaining agreement between the town Simsbury and the CSCA supervisors July 1st, 2019 to June 30th, 2023, which will enter into effect retroactively from July 1st, 2019 and expire on June 30th, 2023. So moved. Okay. Amber. Second. Um, Heather second that. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, thanks, Eric. Okay, the last one is the recycling committee proposal. (laughs) So Tom's here. Um, So if people that were on the board at the end of last year remember that we we, um, moved the recycling committee and sustainability that were separate committees to subcommittees on the clean energy task force. Um, That assimilation never really happened and we had people who were interested in running the swap shop at the, the bulky. bulky waste facility um, and wanted to make sure they could do that because they were trying to get um, volunteers from the Lions Club, which they had secured. So we met um, Tom, Roy, me, and the chair of the committee, Mary Turner, met, and we came up with a proposal that was agreeable um, to all of us to kind of reconstitute the recycling committee as a committee so that they could perform their functions, which are clearly stated in here that they only relate to the swap shop and any actual activities and collections at the swap shop, um, that we would meet twice a year, that I would represent, I would be the liaison to the committee and Tom would be the liaison to the committee. Um, we all seem to work well together. Um, and um, to go from there um, and keep that operational. So that's what this is about. Not sure if anyone has any questions. Okay, so I'm going to move effective June 13, 2022, to approve the creation of the recycling committee as presented. So moved. Thank you. I'll second. And I amber second that. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, so that motion passes. Um, and oh, oh, so now we're done. Goes right into <laughs> it does. <I've, laughs> okay, so so we we have four members um, for the recycling committee. Um, and then I'm going to just read through them. Move effective today. Joe Daly is a regular member. Um, Um, Susan Ray is a regular member, Mary Turner as a regular member, and Rosemary Fusco as a regular member of the um, committee through December 4th, 2023. Do you need a motion? Oh, yeah, I do. I need a motion. Just a quick uh, question, Wendy. Going forward, would the intent be that these would be sourced through the Board of Selectmen or through the town committees like we do with most appointments? I don't know. That would be the board's purview. Yeah, it'd be up to us. Like these were these were people that were on the committee before that we that, yeah. that Mary yeah reached out to. Um, yeah, no, I have no no issue with any of these folks. But going forward, do we intend that that we would um, 
And again, this is a decision by our board that we would we would be accepting appointments from the town committees. Was this committee originally appointed by the town committees? I that I don't know. I can't answer that. I believe so. Okay, so I guess if it falls into the normal appointment of the town committee, then it would follow the same path as long as we yeah. can get the people, people to do the say, job. You know, that's the. Yeah, we, we, we need to make sure. And one thing I want to mention, Eric, is that Joe Daly is on here. He's on the sustainability. So we realized that we kind of had a liaison within a, the committees um, so that there could be some co conversations going through. Um, and I did share this with Mark Scully, what we were doing. So, okay. Um, but, but um, okay, so did, did we get the moat? Did someone make a motion? You did, right? Are we voting uh, no, I said, now? I said, do you need a motion? I do. Okay, uh, so moved. Okay, in a second. I'll second. Okay, Amber, second that. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, so that that passes. <laughs> All right, so, um, yeah, where are we now? Minutes. Full communications minutes. Okay, so um, there's public gathering permits attached. Um, and the minutes, anybody have any comments on the minutes? Okay, so the minutes stand. Um, and... We are now going to, I'm going to need a motion to move to executive session. Anybody want to make that? So moved. Thank you. Very active down there, Chris. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. Okay. Second. Um, second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Oh, go ahead. So we're, hey, do every, you have to say who's going to be in there? Yes. Yep. I don't know who's going to be in there. Be, um, Tom I'll Roy, be. Director of Public Works, Town Engineer, will be joining us, as will um, Attorney DeCrescendo. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, and myself. Sorry, and myself. <laughs> you mention what it is about? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it is it's listed on the agenda. On the agenda. Yeah, yeah. It's certainly it's on reference the it for the minutes. That would be Possible helpful. purchase of a parcel of land, 56 Wolcott Road. Um, okay, so we are now in executive session, I believe.